and then um, I will get us started. I do this every time I think. All right, you all should be seeing my um, my slide now. Thank you again for being here today. Um, this is uh, Volunteering with the Red Cross with Andrew Bogar, and we welcome you today. Um, today's brown bag presentation is made possible because of the generous support of our friends of Ollie. Um, any amount of money that is donated uh, makes a person a friend of Ollie, and um, we are super thankful. Oh, I'll skip that. So thank you to those friends of Ollie. Um, Ollie membership is an investment in lifelong learning and creating the community in which we want to live. Um, we're, we're hoping that people will join Ollie today and throughout this coming next few months as we're trying to increase our membership. Today we have 440 members and we need to reach a thousand members by the end of June um, each year. So if you are not an Ollie member and you're watching today, we hope that you will consider joining. Um, one of the things that we are doing is we are hosting an uh, Ollie virtual open house this year. That's something new and we don't have all the details finalized yet, but you will have a chance to meet some of our winter instructor, instructors and we're, we're planning for that event on the week of um, January 10th through 14th and we don't have the exact time or um, date nailed down yet, but we wanted to let you know to look for those details um, coming soon in the Ollie winter catalog and online and we will send email to our Ollie members to let them know what the schedule looks like. Um, when you came in the room, you were muted, and we ask that you keep yourself muted when you're not talking or asking questions. And Andrew has said that he is happy to field questions throughout his presentation, but we ask you just to pause and wait for a, a break in the conversation or to raise your hand and, and um, wait to be called on. You can also put your question in the chat, and we'll field those, call, those, those questions as well. So thank you, and um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jane so that she can um, tell, you, tell you about the presenter today. Thank you. We're happy to welcome all of you to this presentation and obviously our speaker, Andrew Bogar. He is the American Disaster Program Manager for Help, Help <clears throat> I'll get it out yet, Humboldt, Del Norte and Trinity Counties. He's been with the Red Cross for seven years and has responded to earthquakes, wildfires, mudslides and hurricanes. Andrew, it's yours. We're happy to have you here. Thank you very much. I was actually concerned I, I wouldn't make it today because I can add now flooding to that list. I just got back from the flooding their experience in northwestern Washington. It's so far north Washington that it's practically Canada. Um, so yeah, so I'm glad to be here with everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. I know that everyone, a lot of folks are probably burnt out on PowerPoint. So I'm really just going to try to use this as a way to keep my ADD addled mind uh, on point. Uh, but uh, I would I would encourage everyone to you know raise your hand and, and uh, uh, call me out if someone has a hand up and I haven't seen it. But I want to make this less of me just talking at folks and more of you know answering questions you may have. And don't shy away from difficult questions too. I can handle it. So um, I moved down from Alaska about a year and a half ago. I took over the program. Uh, at that time, we had about. 13 volunteers, and now we're closer to about 40 really solid volunteers between all three counties. And, uh, but we're, but uh, anyways, I wanted to say thank you for uh, listening uh, and participating today. So we're gonna go ahead and move forward. There we go. So the mission of the American Red Cross is something that's pretty standard in all of our presentations, and I like covering it, is, uh, to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mo mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. But simply put, it's really neighbors helping neighbors. Uh, recently through the wildfires is uh, the, the most visible, you know, place we've seen this in action is helping folks with, you know, a place to stay. Um, really quick caveat. Uh, the daycare my daughter is at had a had a COVID incident, and so I have my littlest volunteer with me today. So you may see her on screen, but I am prepared with cocoa melon, goldfish, and crackers. So hopefully that's been addressed. Um, anyways, so back on point. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, really, uh, I 
my, my job is to recruit volunteers and empower them to help their neighbors when they need it the most. Uh, we do this through, through uh, in partnership with a bunch of other, co uh, other uh, organizations within the community. So we are not, a, we are not meant to be a, a, a gatekeeper or, or a, you know, one's, the only show in town. So I will speak about what, what other things are, you know, exist in our community as well. So, but uh, about every, every eight minutes, someone is being helped by the American Red Cross, be that uh, receiving blood that we've collected, responding to natural disasters uh, when they happen. Uh, if anyone's following social media or the news right now, uh, you are aware of the tornadoes that ravaged you know, Illinois, uh, Iowa, Tennessee, and Kentucky. And actually, as we speak, there are three Red Crossers from Humboldt who are already on a plane and are heading towards Kentucky right now. Um, they are, we've got somebody who's going to help manage uh, disaster response vehicles, somebody who supports volunteers, kind of like in an HR capacity, and somebody else is going to go help run a shelter. And so th that is something that people can do. Uh, there's also things here locally that, that folks can do. And the, actually the biggest thing that uh, we respond to are house fires. And uh, so yeah, we, uh, we'll cover the disaster stuff a little bit later. And that's what I'm most familiar with as a disaster program manager. But I do wanna pause and talk about the other, what we refer to as lines of service. And um, Sorry, I saw, I saw a note in the chat. I wanna make sure I address that if somebody had a question. And yes, uh, that is absolutely, actually, uh, thank you very much. It's being, being prepared is absolutely one of the things that we focus on and it actually falls under my program. So I, I'm actually really excited to talk about that because uh, I have a little nugget of, of education uh, tucked away in this when it comes to preparedness. So my first introduction to the American Red Cross uh, was through services to armed forces. Uh, when I was in the army, uh, I was actually, at, so way in the, the bush of Alaska, we were in a large training exercise. Uh, my, my job as a scout was to not be seen, uh, to observe the enemy, report back what's going on. We were training for that. And my command ended up grounding, uh, sorry, stopping convoys, stopping live fire exercises, things had been planned for years. And um, <clears throat> The reason they stopped all this stuff was to find me, because what had happened was is a Red Cross message had come through to my chain of command to let me know that my grandfather had passed, and my parents couldn't get a hold of me. And it's something that I've 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 really you know conditioned them to go. If you can't get a hold of me and something major happens in our family, you need to send a Red Cross message. And the Red the Red Cross partners with the military. We're congressionally chartered. It's one of the two things we are congressionally chartered to do is to support service members, their families, and veterans. Um, and this was my first real interaction with the Red Cross, was getting this message. They stopped the training exercise, they pulled me out of the field, um, sat me down with a chaplain and my commanding officer and said, do you need to go home? And we can work you through and find the resources to do that. You can go home. And, and they helped me with that. And that all, but that was all initiated from a Red Cross message that uh, it's just, it's one of the things that always stood out to me. I'm always proud of the fact that I work with an organization uh, that, ha that, has that, that has that ability. So the other thing is through international services. Um, on an international level, we support the International Red Cross with uh, rubella vaccinations uh, across the world. And the other... <laughs> Not right now, sweetie, okay? Not right now, I'm sorry. <laughs> We've been fine for the last two hours. Okay, um, the, last, the last thing that we do, and this is something I wanna be very transparent with uh, in our community, it's something that I'm struggling with, uh, is the first aid CPR AED training within our community. It is absolutely something that is vitally important to folks to have access to this training. And I currently do not have the capacity to provide that training as broadly as I would like. And I wanna take a moment to pause and talk about the why, is in my, in my position of the Red Cross, everything that I provide to the community must be free. 
uh, all the disaster services, all of the education, all the training that I provide must be free. And that's part of how the Red Cross as a nonprofit is set up. The first aid CPR AED training that we provide and the aquatics courses that are provided are what's considered revenue generating. It's what keeps the lights on. It's what pays my paycheck. It's what keeps our emergency response vehicle. It's parked in our parking lot and ready to go. It's what provides the resources to, to have those, those assets and, those, and the people in place to do the job. That's one of the big things that helps with that. But because everything I provide must be free, I can't touch that program. I can't provide that service because it crosses a line that I'm not allowed to. It's one of the reasons that I can't host fundraisers. Uh, I, I, we could help find a volunteer willing to do that. But at the end of the day, I, I can't touch it with a nine foot pole because it'll violate some rules that we have on the back end. And I, I yeah, it's just something that I can't do myself. And it's something that I, I want to admit and be very transparent with everybody. It's something that we're currently struggling with. I have identified two individuals that provide first aid CPR AED training in the county. If that is something folks are interested, my information is in the chat. You can email me or call me after the event. And I would love to get you in contact with those folks. But as there's only two of them and they're still giving back, um, figuring out how to do the in-person training and provide all the stuff they need um, during COVID, thank you. Um, they, uh, they're still working through that. So just be patient with them as they continue moving forward. So across the US, the, the, the Red Cross is broken into divisions and two chapters. We are part of what's called the Gold Country uh, region. And so yeah, sorry, we'll try that again. We are broken into divisions, regions, chapters, and territories. Uh, we are part of what's called the Gold Country region, which is based out of Sacramento. Uh, the reason I bring that up is because we used to be based out of, our headquarters used to be based out of Santa Rosa. And a year and a half ago, I worked for that region for about a month. And then they transferred me to Gold Country based out of Sacramento. So I had to have, learn a whole brand new staff, uh, brand new support volunteers. And the transition was not as smooth as, a, as I'd like it. Uh, because at the same time, we were also figuring out COVID compliance, working from home. Um, how do you recruit when you can't be in person? And so this transition was already scheduled for years. We knew it was happening. And then, the co and then COVID hit. And so we, we did our best to, to not so much muddle through, but it was definitely, I would, I would be lying if I said it wasn't a challenge. Uh, over the last over the last year and a half, I think we've seen a reduction in our national workforce, uh, our, which are all which are 90% volunteers of about 70,000 volunteers. Those are individuals who, because of pre-existing conditions, because of um, uh, COVID mandates, there's a lot of things that has happened where volunteers have decided that it's not the right thing for them to do at this moment. And we hope, we hope some of them come back. We hope some of them uh, find meaningful opportunities with other uh, partners. And I will always help folks find the right fit for them within the community because we need everybody. Um, but that has definitely affected us both at a national level and even here locally. And I, uh, how we felt that here locally last year was during the fire season, our local volunteers, our handful of local volunteers had to had to hold it down. They were on their own uh, for about a week and a half. And it took about a week and a half before volunteers from the East Coast and the Midwest to start showing up in Humboldt and Trinity County to start taking over the running of those shelters. And I wanna highlight that because, and I, many, many folks who've been here longer than I, they're, they're used to the fact that we're kind of at the end of the map for a lot of large organizations. If you've ever tried to order something and wait for it to show up here. Sometimes we felt that. And last last year was was a product of that. And so it was a challenge that we, we address. So and this is an overview of our region. Uh, that uh, Those three counties, uh, Del Norte, Humboldt, and Trinity counties, that's my territory. I am responsible for those three counties. Uh, and I love it. It reminds me a lot of Alaska. And it's uh, better in many other ways but I am the only employee for all three counties. And so, and that's okay because it's my job to find wonderful neighbors who are willing to, you know, put a little bit of time here and there, learn the skills that they need to help their neighbors and uh, 
various activities uh, and really then just get out of their way. My, my job is to really make sure vehicles have fuel in it and the resources are there and that, you know, the broader goals are being met. But at the end of the day, how we meet those goals are really up to a wonderful uh, growing leadership team of volunteers uh, within organization. No. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but we are, we are supported by uh, t the other territories uh, within our chapter, which are the those northern four groups of colors up there, that's the northern chapter or northern California chapter of the Gold Country region. And uh, the region right now stands at, I think, 300 plus disaster responders. And the bulk of them, of course, are out of Sacramento. And it just takes a long time for them to get here. And that's also... That, that's also with, you know, if there's another disaster going on, like a large wildfire, um, that usually sucks up most of the resources in the initial response. And so we have to, if we need more than what we have locally, it's gotta come from somewhere. And that usually takes time. So just, again, I'd rather be transparent uh, because this is gonna come back when we start talking about preparedness and as a, at a program, you know, the things that we need help with. So again, uh, sometimes I'll get questions about where does the money go and you know what, what's really happening on behind the scenes. Um, if anyone has any questions about that, raise your hand, let me know. I have no problem answering those. Uh, but uh, right now we're sitting actually about closer to 95% of our workforce is volunteers within uh, not just our territory, but the chapter as well. Uh, and 90 cents of every dollar that we spend goes directly towards supporting those who've been displaced in disasters. So what I'm used to responding to about, I don't have a percentage off the top of my head. I'm too new to the area. and I'm still trying to collect all the data to intelligently speak about it, but it doesn't matter if it's a large, national event that gains a lot of attention, or if it is a midnight, uh, a midnight call to a house fire, uh, the Red Cross is notified and we respond to those. Uh, we're, really, uh, we're really, so first of all, we are congressionally chartered to do this through Congress. So even though we, we have that charter, we are a nonprofit. We work completely on donations and volunteers. And but we address things like immediate shelter. At a house fire, we can issue financial assistance that will allow people to stay in a hotel if they choose to. Um, in a large disaster, we're opening up congregate shelters. And let me tell you, two years ago, we put people up in hotels. And that was a logistics heartburn of finding those hotels, making sure people had the services they need from us while they stayed in those hotels in the hotel rooms and not having enough workforce to cover all that was a challenge. On top of that, we, at the 13th hour, we absorbed the last hotel room in the county as people were still evacuating. We had to still even, we had to, after absorbing all those hotel rooms, we had to um, open up a congregate shelter. And this is where I'd like to talk about the community emergency response team. The only way that shelter got opened was with support of our community emergency response teams. And that's a partnership that uh, I am very, very proud of and absolutely would like to support. And they are an amazing organization. And Cliff, since you're on here, uh, do you wanna talk about what the CERT team is for about two or three, uh, about a, couple, a minute or two? You're muted. There we go. How about now? Yep, I can do it. But since you're in the CERT team and you, you run one of them, I think you're the best person to describe it. My name's Cliff Van Cott. I am the team leader for McKinleyville CERT. There are 10 CERT teams in Humboldt County. Judy Snyder, one of the other guests here, leads the Arcata team. CERT is, um, again, it's a volunteer or only organization. Nobody gets paid. There's formal training, about three days worth of uh, formal training on things like first aid, triage, uh, search light, search and rescue, and things like that. <clears throat> the intent is to help fill the gap in a major disaster when all the professional first responders are overwhelmed. 
we have what two shut two sheriffs or two deputies and one fire engine on duty at any time here in McKinleyville. And if something big happens, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to be too busy to handle lots of stuff. So that's one of the things we try and do. We've partnered with the Red Cross almost since our inception. Uh, we do not silo our CERT resources. We have I have active me members on the CERT team who are also active volunteers for the Red Cross, and vice versa. And uh, we we kind of see it as everybody's working towards the same goal. And I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to partner with Andrew. He's a wonderful leader there, and uh, we look forward to helping each other, helping the community more in the future. Thanks for the opportunity to share too. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad you're here and I'm glad for the other perspective because one of the things that I'm very passionate about and I, I try to inform my volunteers is um, we're not the only show in town or the the broader community response cannot fully rest on the shoulders of the Red Cross. It puts us in a position of really being a single point of failure because as we ebb and flow as an organization, if we have a, a lack of volunteers for a particular task, that task still needs to happen people are still displaced. And so it really does take an entire community to be prepared for, respond to, and recover from a disaster. Um, the other organization that just stood up is the COAD, Community Organizations Active in Disaster. It is a coalition of organizations that are putting the work in before the disaster to make sure we're ready for when it happens. And so that's, uh, so if you belong to another nonprofit and you have you are tangentially uh, related to disaster response or serving the community and being ready for a disaster is something you'd be interested in. Uh, take take uh, the fact that you've you've seen me. You can reach out to me uh, at any time. My, again, my contact information is in the chat. And we'd love to sit down with your organization and talk about their preparedness because every faith-based organization food bank, food pantry, homeless outreach entity, uh, any one of them, one of the challenges I'd like to ask is how many of them can we currently do without? And I think the answer is gonna be zero. In fact, in many places, we, we need more of that support. And so if we were hit by a catastrophic disaster, how many of them could actually maintain their services or reopen as quickly as possible after that event? So their preparedness is just as important as our individual or our family's preparedness. And we have resources for that as well. So, okay, so back to this. Like I said, my ADD addled brain. So getting back to what we do in disasters. Uh, we're providing immediate support. Uh, we work with our partners like the Salvation Army to provide food. And so we've got some vendors in the area that we're, we're proud to work alongside with as well. Uh, cleanup uh, cleanup uh, supplies, we have cleanup kits and we have um, hygiene kits as well that we'll use. Um, and we also have, uh, we have disaster volunteers specifically trained in disaster mental health, disaster health services, which is our Red Cross nurses and disaster spiritual care. And those are kind of the three things that we realize that uh, people have particular needs that need to be met within those spaces, but it takes a very special volunteer uh, especially trained volunteer to address those individual needs. So one of the things I want to talk about, and if anyone has seen this as well, feel free to you know put it in the chat or say something or comment on it, uh, but we've seen a major increase in disasters. In 2014, we were having a what we call level four domestic uh, um, operation. Uh, and so down there in the fine print, that's about $250,000 in response that is the finances we're spending to get volunteers there the opening up of the shelters the paying for the food the renting of shower trailers uh, ensuring that we're we're helping buildings you know temporarily get into ada compliance if need be all of that we were doing that about you know one major one a month now in 29 in 2019 and it's still tracking as we go that we're getting about two so currently we have the washington flooding which is moving into the recovery phase. And so organizations like the COAD, faith-based organizations, CERT teams, they're meeting around a virtual table at this point because COVID is still with us, talking about how do we get people back into homes? Uh, where we've lost homes, how do we coordinate the rebuilding of homes? And this is a long-term recovery group. We are part of that conversation. We support that. 
at the same time, we have a disaster going on in the East. Uh, I, we had that same scenario last year. We were also supporting uh, Afghan, uh, well, sorry, earlier this year, we were helping support uh, the Afghan resettlement as um, Afghanistan was what it was. And as an Afghani veteran, or as a veteran of the Afghanistan conflict, I have a particular feeling about it, which I will leave, um, I'll leave by the side right now. Um, but what we are seeing is that disasters are becoming, uh, <laughs> disasters are becoming more frequent and more complex. Also, the areas that are being affected by disasters are much more populated. And what we're finding is that those who need our services um, need it much more. Those individuals being affected by disasters, uh, not only the numbers are increasing, but the resources generally available to them, be it at the community level, being at their own personal resources, aren't what they used to be. Um, your average adult has about 40 bucks to their name. And I can tell you as someone who, who is going through a little bit of a financial crisis right now, that that bears out. We're good. We'll make it. But there are definitely things that I look at and go, mm, that's going to be for the next paycheck. L currently living this gives me an insight into if I were to lose my home right now, I would be barely able to pay. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Of course, I'd have a brain fart right now. Um, the deductible, or, or you know, the, the part of the you know, your homeowner's insurance that you're supposed to pay. Yeah, I can, I can make that, but I wouldn't have a lot left over. So, if I were to experience a house fire, there would be a call from the fire department, the, the to an on-call volunteer in the Red Cross that says we've had a fire the Red Cross is needed. We have a family display standing at the side of the street watching everything that they own burn down. They need Red Cross help. We get that call. That call then that call goes to a volunteer. That on that on-call duty officer then calls our DAT team, our disaster action team. And those are those local volunteers. Those are your neighbors. They're the folks who you know, bag your groceries. They are school teachers. They are retirees. They are retired nurses, school teachers, logistics professionals, you know, people who bring this wealth of experience to the table and are willing to help. They throw on a Red Cross vest, they drive off into the night and they help that family who's been displaced. And the financial assistance that they issue um, means that maybe there's more resources that they can extend that, those resources the family have available to them. And then tying in other partners, uh, one of the organizations I'm proud to say we're starting to work with and hoping to coordinate a response a little bit more with is Pay It Forward Humboldt. Uh, they were instrumental when it came to donations management in the, uh, sorry, donations management during last wildfire season. And I look forward to working with them and finding out how we can partner a little bit more closely when it comes to those affected by home fires. Uh, we have a question in the chat. And do you ordinarily send local volunteers out of the area in disasters? So it's not so much as we send them as we'll ask them. And I know that might be a little bit of semantics, but it is an option. If you are interested in leaving the area, you can do so. Um, one, of, one of the things is, is you have to have all of your training. Uh, you have to you know, be vaccinated. And uh, we can get into that a little bit later if, you, if there's some questions on our our organization status on vaccinations and masks, um, but it is an option that you can choose to do. And I strongly encourage all of my volunteers to deploy. If you, ha if you have the time and you're willing to make that commitment, because going, one of the, the best ways of taking the training, which is really theoretical until you've used it in the real world, um, seeing what a shelter looks like. So a shelter for 200 people. Right now we are sheltering over 200 individuals in Kentucky. The largest shelter we've had set up here in Humboldt is 30 people. And that's, that's good because Humboldt is amazing. It doesn't matter if you're from Trinity or Del Nord or Lake or Mendo when people come here and mostly because they're also doubling up with family, but we, we embrace those, those our, our closest neighbors and take care of them. So our sheltering population is much lower here. Now, I can't say that'll be the case in a 
large catastrophic disaster like an earthquake. But for our fire seasons, um, our, shelter, our, our shelter numbers are relatively low. But by deploying and putting that training into practice, you have real world experience that you can then bring back and share with other volunteers and other, and, and maybe even uh, uh, you know, peers within another organization if, you, if you're in say two groups uh, and, and share that experience. It's also a really mean, for me, it's a really meaningful experience to belong to a large organization with multiple moving parts that are all. So, okay, story time with Andrew. It is an amazing feeling when you get onto an airplane and you're the only person wearing a Red Cross vest or in a Red Cross shirt and you get your next layover and then there's two people in Red Cross clothing and you're like, oh, hey, you're family. I've never met you before in my life, but you're branded with the Red Cross. I know where you're going. I know that you are, you are being drawn to the same chaos to provide similar services or support us in delivering those services. And you get the next layover and now there's seven people in Red Cross gear. You get to the last layover. Now there's 13 people on that plane. Uh, one of the one of the really wow, one of the one of the most amazing ones was a mudslide in Sitka, where the entire plane was Red Crossers, Salvation Army, and FEMA. And just the energy on that plane as we were all coming to the small Alaskan community to do what needed to get done is amazing feeling that you really don't feel really anywhere else unless you are a first responder or in the military or, or, or shared, I'd say maybe some athletic teams, you kind of get that little bit of that high of all being brought together to accomplish a major goal. Uh, it's really meaningful and I, I uh, it's something I wouldn't trade for the world. So, uh, but yes, you can, uh, you can go out of the area if you so choose to. And we have many volunteers who that's not, that's not something they can do. So they, they stay local and they help local. And that's just as important. For those volunteers who leave, we need people to kind of hold down the fort as it were. So, and not everybody has to do disaster response. That's the other thing too. Um, we'll get this a little bit later, but uh, they also provide uh, disaster preparedness education, installing smoke detectors, working with our community partners and making sure that we're aligning with our expectations and they're getting from us what we need. Um, so there's a lot of work that happens in what we call blue skies as much as there is gray skies. And I'd say almost the blue skies work is almost important, more important than the gray skies work because if we're not ready for that disaster, it makes the disaster even more complicated. So last, last year, here's some generic stats. Uh, they're, they're broad, I, I don't have, and this is also from the regional perspective. All of the meals served, nights overstayed in our shelters, I collect all that in a document and as we are doing it, and I have to report that to my headquarters and we share more of the broader numbers. I just don't have those numbers readily available for this presentation because I got back, <laughs> I just got back from flooding. I'm sorry that I haven't had a chance to update these numbers or have more finite numbers about our local area. I can tell you that last wildfire season, we opened a total of eight shelters and that did not that that was chaotic it was not the best service to our clients and this was because we didn't have all that blue skies work done with our sheltering partners because we don't own shelters we have to work with schools and churches and other entities that have spaces that could be used as a shelter and there just wasn't enough time and enough folks to work uh, to maintain those relationships. So when we had to open up a shelter, we kind of had to play hops, shelter hopscotch a little bit, uh, whack-a-mole. And ultimately, I feel bad about that because that didn't provide consistent service to those who were displaced from Trinity County. And I think ultimately, we could have done better and we have some work to do. But that's one of the things that, that I'm uh, I'm very I'm very transparent about is, you know, where we have the work to do, I want to own it because if I don't, it may not get done. So, so a couple more, some more, uh, a couple more statistics. But what I did do is I pulled out the the stock images, and these are actually your neighbors in these pictures. Um, the picture from down at the bottom was actually the shelter the CERT team helped us set up. That was actually from two years ago at uh, the Ferndale Fairground. Yep, Ferndale Fairgrounds. Uh, the vehicle above that was our emergency response vehicle. People can become trained to drive it. It's not that bad. It's actually super easy. And that vehicle has actually been retired and we have a brand new 
shiny emergency response vehicle parked out front of our office that is much easier to drive. Um, but again, it provides the same service. And then the picture above that is one of our volunteers from Del Norte who came to Trinity County uh, to help open a, a LAC, a local agency center. So it's a, a, a room full of community partners. It's one-stop shopping for folks who've been displaced and affected by disasters and getting them the things they would need to either sustain themselves until longer term recovery efforts are in place or help them with casework, um, replace you know, government documents and we're present in that space as well. So right now I'd say this is our biggest need, the disaster action team. Uh, they are, so these, uh, the local office is in McKinleyville. I can, I will find and copy paste the address into uh, the chat if folks are interested, or you can call me or email me. You can also text, you can find me on Facebook. I am, my job is to be as available to the community as possible in order to get folks the help they need or get them the things they need to help their neighbors. So reach out to me, we, I can get you that information. Uh, but our disaster action team is the local, they are the local volunteers who are the initial response. Something you'll hear from a lot of professional responders are all disasters are local. Yep, if we have a catastrophic disaster, folks are gonna come from as far as Rhode Island and Miami and Houston and Maine, they'll be here. At some point, they're gonna go back. And at the end of the day, it's still gonna be local folks who initiate the response because it takes a while for people to get to us. And we're gonna still be here putting those pieces back once those army of friends go back home. And it's going to be the disaster action team, those local volunteers who are trained to step up immediately and begin helping their neighbors. And right now I have two volunteers who are on call in Humboldt County. And that doesn't mean like volunteer firefighters or paid firefighters, they're sitting at the station waiting for the bell to ring. They're going about their everyday life. And usually they go about a month before we get a call. We're getting a, we're getting a fire call about once a month. Um, and that is when we, we take in Del Norte and Trinity counties, it's about one and a half every month. So we don't get a lot of fire calls. And that becomes part of the challenge of keeping people engaged and excited about participating with us if they don't get to apply the training that they've learned. Um, but when that call happens, we can't drop the ball. We have to have people trained and ready to go help their neighbors, go wrap that blanket around somebody, go um, hand them a bottle of water. And while last year and a half have been tricky with doing that, you know, how do we do that while keeping people at arm's reach and can't put a blanket around them, that was a challenge. We are now able to go back to that in-person training because all of our volunteers have to be vaccinated. And so that is something that we're holding ourselves to. Um, there is a process to verify that while protecting personal information and it doesn't violate HIPAA the way we do it, but we cannot endanger our volunteers first and then we can't endanger our clients when it comes to the spread of COVID. So all of our volunteers um, will be vaccinated uh, by, and we're not mandating that they do it. Everyone has a choice. Uh, but if you're gonna be in disaster response and you're gonna be in close proximity to uh, clients, we don't refer to folks affected by disasters as victims. We use the term client. Um, we, uh, you're gonna have, to, you know, folks will have to be vaccinated. So more on that if questions, if people have questions. Uh, the other thing that our disaster action teams will do is they're the first people we call to help open up shelters. And the last, then the uh, staff temporary evacuation points. Uh, really they're meant to be short term. Uh, response typically lasts about an hour. Uh, that will also include your drive times. Now, if the fire is in, oh, Gerberville, Redway, Orleans, response might take a little bit longer if you're coming from McKinleyville or Eureka. And the dream is to actually have volunteers in all the corners of our counties so they don't have to drive that far. But uh, we realize it is what it is and people who are, you know, people are where they are and that's okay. Uh, we just let the clients know that we are on our way and we expect to be there about this time. Sometimes they can meet us midway. Sometimes they say, that's fine. It's three o'clock in the morning. Could you meet us in the next day? That's okay too. It, it, it's very flexible to meet the volunteers and the client's needs. And it, it's built that way. 
You will never respond by yourself. You will never open a shelter by yourself. You will never respond to a fire by yourself. You will always be there. Now, if you are brand new to the organization, you will always be there with someone who is senior um, until you take the training and have the experience. And then you and you too could become the senior volunteer. But we have a process for that. We have training for that. And we make sure that you're comfortable before we ask anybody to step into that position of leadership. And really it's more of mentoring. Remember that everybody is new to begin with. Uh, right now, I'm really proud. We've got five disaster action team supervisors and they're local folks who started a year ago and they've just been slowly working through that training and this is the first year that they're as i have one volunteer who has been a rock star and has been before i showed up and took the job here as a volunteer she was running the program she's my volunteer partner if i'm hit by a bus tomorrow she knows all the secrets she has all the same authority that i do and that's how we run the program it's volunteer led um this last fire that we had was the first fire she didn't have to participate in either as oversight or as a supervisor. And that's because the program is slowly but surely growing. But as these volunteers be, are, um, as they start you know, as a trainee and then move up, you know, move up the process. I don't like using move up and rank. We don't really have a rank system. It's not the military, uh, but as they move up, we need folks to replace them. We need folks who are willing to, to join them in this. So, so open to see opening shelters, staffing temporary evacuation points was just a temporary safe place for people to come as they're like, okay, is the fire gonna get contained? Did they put the fire out? It's not quite a shelter. It's not meant to have people overnight, but it's something that we do. It's something really new based out of COVID. The other thing that ex a very experienced debt members can respond to is, uh, I'm not supposed to talk about this, but I'd rather be transparent about it because we don't want to scare new volunteers away. Um, but transportation incidents, you know, mass casualty incidents. We are often called in by the NTSB or other large federal entities because they know that we provide that disaster mental health, disaster spiritual care, and dis mental health, spiritual care, and mental health, disaster health services. Um, but we have those resources. And so oftentimes as people are grieving or need a place to receive the information about what hospital their loved ones went to, um, we are those compassion, we are that compassion organization that is called to help run that facility with dignity and uh, discretion. And so that, that is a special track that if people are really interested in, we can have that conversation. But again, that comes from our local disaster action team. And the reason I bring that up is because we have an airport here. And so that is something that, that my team could be called to do. The other one most people are familiar with is uh, our mass care team that's sheltering and feeding. We're not really actively recruiting for this right now, but everyone hears it. I think to a certain point, we're tired of hearing about it. Um, is fire season. Fire season is going to happen. We, know, we all know it. And while, uh, and so it's something that in a little while I'll start pushing a little bit more to get more uh, shelter volunteers trained and ready to go. Uh, so the last question about, uh, can people leave the area if, they, and yes, you can. Hand that here, please. I don't know how you found that. It is very sharp. Yes, please, thank you for handing me broken glass. I don't know where that came from. Can you please sit down? Thank you. Sorry, we have cats. They knocked down one of the Christmas ornaments and apparently I missed one of the shards and a two-year-old found it. That makes me very nervous. Okay, thank you for sitting down, Rose. All right, I'm back. So, um, a, a de typical deployment within the Red Cross lasts two weeks. So if you are leaving the area, one of the things you need to consider is uh, your commitment will be for two weeks. And that's outside of the Northern California area, those, those, those counties I showed earlier. Um, if it's inside that area, it can be anywhere for a handful of days to a week if necessary. If you're a nurse, a mental health professional or a chaplain, it's also uh, that you, you, can only, uh, you can also do a week if that fits for your schedule. Because realize a lot of nurses have to get back to work or uh, you have the practice you have to go back to. So there's a little bit of flexibility for those volunteers. 
Uh, right now, I would say the DAT team and our sheltering team is where we have the biggest vulnerability. If we were hit, I know I, I know with a surety, we can run at least one, sh one shelter. Uh, but when you take into account any of the large disasters that we have, we usually need two. And so we just do not have the capacity. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to talk to you about is a little bit of rough volunteer math. The Red Cross can traditionally only mobilize about 10% of its workforce at any given time. And that is because those local volunteers are grandparents and they're watching the grandkids. So mom and dad can go to work. We get it. It's part of life. Um, many times our volunteers are employers or employees. They can't leave either. We also acknowledge that some of our volunteers are also affected by the disaster. Last year, we had, a, we had two volunteers running our shelter in Trinity County and uh, with some other non-local folks, but they were in charge. It was their shelter, it was their community. Um, they didn't know they had a home to go to because they had to evacuate themselves. So they would have been going to the shelter anyways, is how they explained it. That makes me a little bit nervous. Self-care is very important, uh, but that's the kind of folks that they are. And uh, so I, I bring that up to say, sometimes we're affected by the disaster. And if, uh, so we, that's why we can only really mobilize about 10% of his workforce. And it takes about eight to 11 people to effectively run a shelter, which means I need about 80 to 110 people trained in sheltering. I currently have 13 with another four in the training process. And, and again, I'm, I wanna be very transparent about where we are. Now, we work with wonderful partners in the CERT team. We have other organizations, uh, mostly from the faith-based community who are interested in receiving sheltering training and I will continue to work with them. Uh, but at the end of the day, the county really looks to us to, to help support their shelters when, when they're opened. So that's something that I'm really, I'm wanting to really focus on really strong. There's a third activity that I think is just as important. That's our preparedness team. So these are this uh, individual disaster care is that health services, mental health and spiritual care. And then when we have those incidences, when there are fatalities, unfortunately, we have a specific team called the Incident Condolence Care Team. So if you do have those skills, if that's something that you, you feel like you have the capacity for, it's something you'd be interested in, please talk to me. It's absolutely something that, that we have. I have no, I have zero uh, disaster mental health volunteers in the area. When we have an event that requires them, I have to call them in from Sacramento even farther. So if anybody, if anybody has a practice, anyone, if anyone's licensed to practice as a like a, a practice counselor, please send them my way. I'd really like to have that capacity locally because we really do need it. Uh, logistics. Um, everyone knows that an army marches on its stomach, but we, it takes cots and comfort kits and cleanup kits and vehicles. It, it takes things to do this response. And we have a very, we have a, a special team of three volunteers who focus on logistics. So um, if that is something that you have, an if you have experience in, it's something you'd be interested in, we have a role for it. If you guys can't tell, this is where I fall in a large disaster is external relations, because I like to talk. Uh, but what external relations job is to do is to really communicate on behalf of the Red Cross to other entities government partners, community partners, and the public broadly. So if anyone has uh, experience in communications or is really comfortable with social media, and you have an interest in maybe communicating disaster information when the folks need it the most, by all means, please reach out to me. This is something that we, we I have two volunteers in. And this is another thing that we really struggle engaging volunteers with. It's called disaster workforce engagement. Um, many often, oftentimes in volunteer organizations, you hear that volunteers are the lifeblood of our organization. They absolutely are. And if that's the case, disaster workforce engagement is the beating heart. Uh, they help brand new volunteers get into the program. They orientate volunteers based on conversations and saying, you know, it sounds like you're really interested in logistics. Let's sit down and let's talk about that. Um, when a volunteer completes their training, they're making sure that, you know, they're recognized and it's, it's appreciated. And uh, when you have a workforce of around, on paper, we have a workforce of about 87, as of yesterday, 87 volunteers. Um, I don't know everybody. 
it's impossible for me as one person to know everyone. And so I need help making sure that we haven't forgotten somebody's birthday or we, we're making sure that everyone knows what classes they need to be taking next. So they get to the opportunity that, they're, that brought them into the first place. And I currently have two volunteers, one in Humboldt, one in Del Norte for, for this activity. And this is right now one of the biggest things that we really struggled with last year is because we couldn't be in public educating people. We really struggled trying to teach edu uh, preparedness education via a virtual opportunity. And it was tough. People missed the interact, the human interaction. So we have a program to help educate youth from K to two. We have a youth program that helps with grades three to five. Uh, there is the we have a free smoke detector program. Uh, we also do have a, a hands-only CPR program that volunteers can teach. It isn't for certification, so it isn't something you would pay for, but also you won't have a certification uh, for your employer, which is what many people are looking for. And that, that CPR course is really important to me because I think Every, everyone should know CPR, just like I think everyone should know how to put a tourniquet on somebody if it really came down to it, or how to apply pressure to stop bleeding. CPR is one of those things that everyone should know. Our, our, our community preparedness education volunteers also can do events similar to this, but are squarely focused on preparedness. And we also with, work with churches, schools, and businesses and helping them with their emergency plans as well. Okay, I promised that we talk about uh, and talk about preparedness a little bit. Um, so the Red Cross has a three-step model in preparedness and check, grade me on this. The official way we talk about it is make a kit, make a plan, be informed. Uh, notice that I put it around the other direction. So the reason I teach it this way is before we make a kit, before we ask people to spend money on things that they're gonna put into a bucket or a tub or a bag, Make sure they're the actual things that you need. Like what are the disasters you expect to experience? Um, where do you spend the bulk of your time? Uh, it went, if there's a chance that you may be at work, your partner may be at work, other members of your family may be in school, um, your preparedness plan, plan is going to look different than if you are retired and you spend your time not at home all the time, but definitely not at a workspace the same way. So really being informed, I, I think, is, is really the best place to start. Once you're informed about what, the, what disasters are in your area, how are you going to get notified when a disaster happens, then make your plan. Once you know what your plan is, are you going to go to a loved one's house? Are you going to shelter in place? If you evacuate, where are you going to go? And if you come to a Red Cross shelter, everyone is welcomed. You can, you can come to a Red Cross shelter. We, we will have services and partners available to help you with your needs while you stay with us. Um, we realize that's not for everybody. And so whatever your plan is, uh, if your plan is to stay with loved ones, I suggest reaching out to them and having that conversation before showing up on their doorstep. But whatever your ultimate goal is when it comes to evacuating or, or weathering a disaster, that then informs your kit. So the, the one freebie I have is that QR code. For those who have smartphones, if you hover your, like you're gonna take a picture of that, that, that digi looking barcode thingy, that's a QR code. What that will do is that will take you to the app store where, you where we have a free Red Cross app. Doesn't cost you anything. And it is how I'm tracking how many shelters are, are open in Washington or how many shelters were open in, uh, Kentucky right now. It tell it tracks tornadoes. It, it sends me updates when there's an earthquake. I, I set the earthquake to a certain level. So, cause we're in a really seismically active area. And if you, you set that threshold too low, it's always going off. Like don't wake me up unless it's a 5.0. I come down from Alaska and I'm used to it. So, but it's a free app and not just for you, share it with your loved ones. We get really nothing out of it. It doesn't bombard you with ads. Really, it is a way, it's a coordinated way of collecting data from our federal partners and our other, like, so like the National Weather Service and sends it directly to your phone and it gives you an update when there's something that you need to be aware of. When a wildfire happens and there's an evacuation for your area and it tells you that, hey, 
your neighborhood just went under an evacuation warning or order, it then also gives you next steps that you need to be thinking about. Um, I experienced an earthquake in Juneau and I had just gotten married and <laughs> I have a blended family and getting my family to pack that suitcase and we need to go was really eye-opening to them. That was like, the, that was first time my, my wife went, no, 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 you're right. We need a kit. I'm like, I know I've been saying it for a while. <laughs> so until you're in that moment, you have that adrenaline setting in. Um, you don't really know the things that you forget until you're driving down the road and go, oh, I forgot my cell phone charger. How am I going to power my phone to be able to tell everybody that I made it safe? So uh, I suggest downloading that app. Um, it's incredibly helpful. All right. So that sums it up. Um, we are at one o'clock, so I, I guess I didn't do that bad on time. Uh, but if any, there's any questions, if there's any, any comments, <laughs> lay it on me. Uh, I, my favorite part is actually talking to the folks that I, I live around and talking about preparedness. If you can't tell, this is kind of my jam. Well, that was very thorough, and we thank you very, very much. If anybody has any questions, <clears throat> either put them in the chat or raise your hand. Goes like that. Anybody? Yes, Judy, unmute yourself. Okay. Um, several of us on the search team have been wondering what does the Red Cross actually have stored in the area ready to, to open up and assist? Um, partly because we are also doing something similar to that, and we should be working together on this and we should know what's already in place. Agreed. So we have eight disaster trailers throughout my three county territory. I have three in Del Norte. I have one in Trinity. I'm working on trying to get a second one for Trinity because it's a very big county that can get cut off by fires or landslides. I have one in McKinleyville. I actually have two in McKinleyville right now because it's, it had some refurbished work to do. Um, I have one, it, one of those two, one will go to either Ferndale or Fortuna once I have an agreement in place. I have one in Redway and I have one in Willow Creek. All of our trailers are set up to support a shelter of 50 individuals. I have one tow vehicle. So if we need to move those trailers somewhere and it's not within the Eureka Arcata corridor, it's going to take a little while. So we're working on finding community, either volunteers who are willing to uh, go through the process to become author, you know, authorized towers if they have a truck and they're willing to do so, or government partners who are willing to tow the vehicles on our behalf. And we haven't really been met with any, any, con any concerns with our, our government partners and saying, sure, where do you need the trailer? All right, we'll send a sheriff's officer out there and we'll haul it to insert shelter here. Uh, we are currently going through an audit of all of our shelter facilities. Um, I, inherited, I inherited a list of potential shelters that hadn't been vetted in a long time. And so where our key facilities are is somewhat vague or it's, it's not as concise as I would like it to be. When I'm done with that list, when, when I'm done with that list and I have my logistics and mass care volunteers go through it and make sure that yes, this is a space we absolutely need to be in. We open the doors on a place and it can only hold five people, 15 people. It's not an ideal shelter if the population being evacuated is 50. So we're, we need to work through that list. And that's, that's one of our goals this year is to ground that list and, and without a doubt have key facilities who know there are facilities and are ready to go. Give me a quick moment. I have to go address a, a toddler concern. Give me a second. I apologize. <laughs> Judy, maybe you could talk for a moment about how many search volunteers we have in oh, our as, area. As Chris said, we have 10 teams. Um, we've got 13 in our 13 uh, members in Arcata right now. We are going to be having a community class coming up, hopefully maybe April is being planned now to train more people as volunteers. Just, you know, basically to be able to help your own family and help your neighbors. Um, and actually have been really busy during the last year, almost two years, 
even though we are meeting online and so on. So we've, we're accomplishing things and stay tuned. And Cliff, do you have also comments like that? Yeah, we have, um, we have 23 registered vetted members in our team. Um, Humble Bay Fire Cert is probably twice that many. And uh, it, so each team is a standalone entity, but all together we can probably mass about 40 people um, on a really, really, really good day. But <laughs> typically it's gonna be twos and threes. Mm -hmm. Actually, Just one thing we're, back. we're discovering though is many of our members wear multiple hats with multiple disaster related organizations. And they have not figured out how to clone themselves yet. And that's one of the things that we're finding is I have volunteers who volunteer at the animal shelter and volunteer at a food bank. They volunteer at their church. And so when there's a need, they're, they're asking, what hat do I put on? And uh, again, going back to some of those volunteer, vo volunteer numbers, a community can only really get about 10% of its population to volunteer. It's about 10 to 20% of your population, depending on how big your population is. And so the question comes down to how do we live what's called the four C's? And this is the four C's of VOAD or COAD. And that is communicate, cooperate, collaborate, and coordinate. So we're hit by a, a, an incredibly large catastrophic earthquake. My volunteers, I expect them to put on green vests and go do cert stuff. That's going to be the most immediate need in their neighborhood. And that's going to be my push to any of my volunteers is to go get that cert training. Because my, the first three things that you need to do in a disaster is check on yourself, check on your family, check on your home. And then if you feel comfortable and you're trained to do so, help your neighbors. The same person who jumped your car so you're not late, same person who you'd say, I need you to watch my kids so I can take my husband to the hospital would be this, your first responder in an emergency. But if you're gonna put yourself in that position, get yourself trained so you have the confidence in yourself when that moment happens. And two, three days in that disaster, okay, maybe shelters are open and we can use you in the shelter, but you were able to put on that green vest and helmet first. Okay, now the shelters are open. Okay, so we need red crossers. Maybe it's time for you know a mix of green vests and red vests in the shelter. Um, okay, but people still need to eat. So the Salvation Army has volunteers and maybe there's another organization that has volunteers that, you know, they're usually working a soup kitchen. Wonderful. You're feeding volunteers and you just didn't know it yet. Let's get you in, con let's get you in contact with the Salvation Army and let's train on feeding if you're comfortable doing that. And the problem we will sometimes run into is some faith-based organizations find working with each other, maybe a little abrasive sometimes, but in a disaster, what I found is nine times out of 10, you know, when you watch a Hollywood disaster movie, everything breaks down in anarchy and people are shooting. That's not the case. I mean, usually what ends up happening is we've seen gang wars stop because grandma is affected. And in those shelters, you may have different colors. Nobody steps out of line because grandma will say something. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really interesting how communities actually respond to disasters in, uh, in, in comparison to what Hollywood tells us is normal. Looking at you, zombie apocalypse movies. Um, however, what we're finding are disasters are becoming much more complicated, much more expensive. Um, the folks in our shelters uh, have much limited resources than they used to 20 years ago. And so it's, so Mayfield, Kentucky right now, uh, the, 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 the community that was beyond decimated. Uh, if that community doesn't have a plan to recover, it may not be a community, 50, you know, five years from now. If, so I, I living in Juneau, we had two OBGYNs. If one of those OBGYNs experience a house fire, it doesn't have to be a catastrophic mudslide or an earthquake or tsunami, just a house fire. And they can't find a new place to live and they have to move to another community. That's now affected 50% of your population or, or in some cases over 50% of your population. And, and it's, it's these, these little things that, that 
I would love to have volunteers who, who kind of drink the Kool-Aid. I know that's the, not, not the most best way of saying that, but really understand preparedness. If you were a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout, you know, if you, if you have a preparedness kit and you're comfortable t- having this conversation with your neighbors, um, the more people who are prepared, the more people who have a kit or are comfortable talking to their neighbors who are saying, look, I can't save the world. I can't do everything, but I can help at least two people. That's where community resiliency really comes from. And, re- and rebuilding a community, it's not about be scared of the next disaster, be scared of the earthquake. It's really, how much do you love living here? What do you love about being here? Well, the faster we, the faster we recover from a disaster, the faster we all get back to doing what we love. And, and that's really how I would appro- approach disaster preparedness and response. It's not be scared of it. It shouldn't be the end of the world. It should be a minor inconvenience as we put all the pieces back into place. And that takes a whole community. So if you belong to an organization and that organization's interested in stepping into this realm, I will get you in contact with the COAD. If you are interested in helping out at the street level and maybe the Red Cross isn't for you, please reach out to our CERT team of folks here in the, in the room. Uh, that's an amazing organization. But if you're interested in you know, taking an extra step and the, the basic skills of what to say to somebody who's lost everything in a house fire, and I know that sounds intimidating, but I'd like to be transparent about what we're asking people to do. Um, that, you know, you're not on call 24 <laughs> seven. A shift is about six hours. So if it doesn't happen in your six hours, you're not going. Um, the training takes about 13 hours and it's online. We are now doing in-person training again. So that's a thing. So if you're interested in doing it in person and not all online in three months, we'll be in Humboldt teaching it, but because Trinity County only has really four volunteers right now in the entire county, I have to start there. They're, they are my most vulnerable county and they burn every year. I need more volunteers out there. So January, I'm squarely focused on getting Trinity up off the ground. Del Norte's right behind them. So in February, uh, I'm doing a series of training out there. And in March, I'll be doing training here in Humboldt in person at our office. And I wouldn't like to invite everybody who's interested uh, to reach out to me. And we can have a more we have a more one-on-one conversation. I think that's probably the best way of getting people's, what are you into? What intimidates you? What are you not willing to do? How long are you available? That's really how we should be doing recruiting is getting to know each other and getting to know the organization. You really can't do that in an hour and eight minute presentation. But if I can encourage people to at least consider it, uh, maybe get to know the Red Cross a little bit more. Um, We've been around for, we've been like, like I like to tell people, we've been around for, since the Civil War. So we've been screwing it up for over 200 years. Take our lessons learned and a- apply them where appropriate. So we're there for our neighbors when they need it. And if this is something that interests you, if the way that I approach it is something that interests you, reach out to me because we absolutely need more folks. Yes, Sandy. Is there an email list to get on so that we'll know when um, the trainings are going to begin in March? Uh, not Formally, the best way of doing it is actually by joining the Red Cross because all of that, com- that communication really is internal. Let me fill it up for you. <laughs> I know you want to hold it, but we have a habit of spilling it on dad's notes. <laughs> so um, what I would like to do is get better at communicating more broadly with the public. And so one of the ways we will start doing that is through uh, the Humboldt COAD, Community Organizations Active in Disaster. Um, and they will help with some of that outreach. We'll go through uh, Humboldt OES, Office of Emergency Services, uh, when appropriate. But a lot of that communication right now is internal. And, and that's because a lot of what we talk about will sometimes have to do with client information. And so there, there's some privileged information that comes along with that. Um, but if you belong to an entity who just wants to learn about shelter training, I have training that I can do that's external to the Red Cross. So if a church was interested or if another organization, the Lions Club or a Rotary, I think the most interesting, interesting group of folks I've ever taught sheltering to was a group of teachers in Prince of Wales, Alaska. Uh, their emergency manager brought me in to teach them sheltering. I started the class and everyone looks at me and goes, we thought you were to teach us about preparedness. This isn't in our union. Like, well, 
So your emergency manager is in the room. I'll let you have that conversation here. But my question to you is, in an emergency on an island this small, where is everybody coming? Well, the schools are the, are the tsunami shelters. All right. In this community of a little over 1,200, does everybody know you're the teacher, one of the teachers that works here? Yep. Who do you think they're going to come to in an emergency to go, can we use this? Can we use this bathroom? Where's the toilet paper? Can we store our medicine in this refrigerator? Can we use the microwave? Oh, how do we clean the microwave? They're going to come to you for that. I'm just here to provide you the training to help you through those moments until backup can arrive. And the Red Cross is backed up by, you know, a really large group of volunteers who are willing to show up and they're mobilizing right now to Washington and Kentucky, but there's not enough. And, and we are a long way away from help. It's going to really come down to the, you know, folks like you and I going, all right, it just happened. How are we going to do this? And everyone has a seat at that table. Everyone has a role to play. Even if it's just, I've got my grandkids, I've got a kit. I can take care of these four people of my life. Those are three people that aren't in a shelter. And honestly, recovering at home is going to be much more healthy than staying in a shelter. We want to do the best we can, but being in a place that's familiar to children and family members, that that is a really powerful, powerful thing in their recovery. So I acknowledge that. My question is, is as you're doing that, how do we support you in that? So that's something that I'm looking at and I don't have an answer for. So I need folks who are interested in helping with some of these unique situations that we're going to have to, we're going to have to answer in the next, you know, three to five years, especially as things get hotter. We, st we, we, we keep seeing less rain and as the population keeps growing, but, you know, extending the limited resources even further. So if you're interested in helping with that, call me, email me, my information's in the chat. Okay, Chris, do you have a question? I see your hand there, or is that a, thank you. You wanna unmute yourself if you have a question? Chris, Chris. Going, 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 gone. All right. All right. Anybody else have any questions? If not, I want to thank Andrew for a fine presentation. Very detailed, very helpful. Uh, I'm sure people will have questions afterwards, and he's left you his contact information. And we want to thank you all very much for coming. Wish you happy holidays. We're on vacation with Ollie until January. And when we'll have two more talks in January and two in February for the winter semester. So thank you very much. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. And we'll see you in the new year. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, thank you Andrew. for all you do.